Hi, my name is Anita Amstutz and welcome to the Berkey Bee City USA Virtual Pollinator Festival. We're so grateful that you have joined us. We are here actually at the Open Space Visitor Center in their pollinator garden, which is so fantastic. It has all these flowers that pollinators love. There's like actually a flyer on me, but many bees, native bees. We have all kinds of honeybees. We keep bees here and we're gonna take you inside the hive, hands inside the hive this morning. Very exciting um, to see what goes on inside a honeybee hive. And all of us have masks on and we are abiding by the masks in public as long as uh, we are in a COVID-19 situation. But that's why we're having this virtual celebration. But you know, it's way fun to be able to do this with you in a virtual way. So here's a sign that shows us the Bee City USA designation that our city got the first city in the Southwest to become a Bee City USA. And that is a national designation that actually says we are protecting pollinators and we are trying our best to work with all bee groups and all uh, the city council and all city groups to have the healthiest possible habitat for bees. So we're grateful that you joined us for our hive tour today and to be here at this absolutely gorgeous Open Space Visitor Center, which is your center, actually. It is for you to come out and visit and find a sense of peace and find a sense of joy as you can sit among the flowers and the bees and the all pollinators and all the, uh, the immense kinds of um, the grounds that they keep here so, so wonderfully for the public. So thank you for being here. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Owen and I'm the beekeeper for the New Mexico Beekeepers Association's um, kind of like a master beekeepers program, but we call it the certified beekeeping program here. And we have hives for the students down here at Open Space at the end of this alfalfa field here. And they're the top bar hives that we're gonna look at later. Um, but yeah, I hope you're gonna enjoy this um, virtual pollination celebration this year as we're all dealing with COVID, wearing our masks, and um, yeah, just a great experience. are considered agricultural, but they're actually wild creatures. <laughs> we, they're not domesticated in the way we think of domesticated cows and sheep and such. You know, bees are uh, really wild and there's a lot that we still don't know about them. We, we learn something and then they teach us something new and we learn some more and then, and then we're mystified by what's going on in the beehive. So, what we do know right now is that bees are struggling with uh, varroa mites, which were imported from a bee that came from China. And we're also uh, dealing with varroa, you know, all kinds of parasitic diseases that go along with that as well as fowl brood. So Amy can talk about some of that when she's in the hive. So bees have, um, a lot against them, arrayed against them, and they're so critical for our food system, as we know. One out of three bites are due to bees, gratis to bees. But you can help because any native plants that you put in your backyard, anytime you support them with flowers and flowering bushes and flowering trees that are native to New Mexico, um, that will help them immensely to, to have food. Mm -hmm. or plant your gardens. They love anything with flowers, flowering. Things. Yeah, they love herbs. <laughs> herbs, yes. Plant an herb garden. <laughs> so we start by this. So this is our smoker, or my smoker. Um, and what I like to do is put manure in it because it burns um, slowly and the smoke from it is nice and cool so the bees aren't agitated and getting burned while we give them smoke. Um, so we can go ahead and walk over here. And Amy, what's the purpose of smoking? We smoke right. bees. Right. So um, 
I've even had kids ask, does that kill the bees? Absolutely not. The smoke um, really inhibits their pheromone that they send throughout the hive, telling the other bees that there's a predator and that they need to be more defensive. And so it blocks that fear pheromone they send out. And you can even smell it, it kind of smells like banana. So anytime I smell a lot of banana, um, I give them a little more smoke. Um, but also there's another theory that the smoke um, encourages them to gorge on honey while you're in the hive. Because in nature, if they smelled smoke nearby, that means there's a fire. They need to get all the honey they can and then they're gonna take off and leave. And so, yeah, it might be twofold what smoke does, but it <laughs> so helps. Just a little bit. We just never want to overdo it. Like bees, you know, it's, it's insulting to them to put too much smoke on them. Just enough to let them know that something's changed here and they need to be on, you know, be aware that something's different. Yeah, so I give them a few puffs of smoke at the entrance and kind of where the vents are. I always think of it as like, I'm just letting them know I'm coming. <laughs> and then sometimes when they get aggravated, I'm like, let's clear the air, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good point. All the, all the girls in the hive, uh, the worker bees are girls. And so you're saying, well, what about the boys? Well, the boys are called drones. And they usually, uh, the queen will lay drone eggs once, a couple, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year spring and into summer if she needs to, um, if she knows that the queens need to be mated. So um, drones are really important in that they carry the, you know, the DNA that they will inseminate the queen with. Um, but after the drones have done their job of inseminating the queens in the area, Uh, the girls will kick them out. Yeah, you'll see the worker bees, the female worker bees, um, kicking out drones. <laughs> kind of like late summer and all throughout the fall, they're getting them out because they just take resources. Um, it's kind of mean. Yeah, it's sad. It's sad. <laughs> they kick the, kick the drones, the boys out. Mm -hmm. So this is a top bar hive, meaning there are bars on the top <laughs> that they hang wax from. And you'll see that in just a little bit as we get further towards the front of the hive. I like to always start at the back. Um, this particular top bar hive, they think originated with the Peace Corps over in Africa where they were observing um, how native bees make their hives in the wild. And they like to have, yeah, hello. Beekeeping is part of agriculture, guys. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But bees, native bees in the wild, like to um, build out their hives in uh, empty logs, empty hollowed out trees. And so this was kind of a way of making a beehive that really was more like nature intended. Beautiful. I'm glad we have this to show you. So um, this is beautiful, gorgeous new white comb. Um, they've just hit a nectar flow down here. And so that means they're finding um, good sources of nectar in the plants nearby. And they can fill this comb with nectar that then turns into honey. And the way they turn that nectar into honey is by flapping their wings to reduce the water content. So the water evaporates off of the nectar and becomes honey. It's called dehydration. So Amy, talk about what these girls down here are doing and, yes. and the structure of this beautiful uh, hexagonal. So these girls down here are what's doing what's called festooning. And what they do is they hold on to one another. You can like touch them, <laughs> they're so gentle. But they hold on to one another as kind of like a scaffolding for creating more comb. And there's wax that's secreted from their abdomen to um, make this comb. So they get the wax from their abdomen and then they use their mouth parts and arms to kind of manipulate it and create the beautiful comb here. So yeah, a lot going on. Goodness. Anita was talking about drones 
And it's funny because I always move my drone comb to the back so they'll fill it with honey, <laughs> which they're doing, but there is still some drone comb or baby drones that haven't emerged from these cells yet. You see that papery? Yeah. Looks like peanuts. Right here, that's all baby droned inside of there. So you can see up here, it's capped honey. Has like that waxy finish when it's capped. But um, bee brood has kind of more of a papery covering of wax, like these drones right here. And so these drones have emerged and then they've filled that with honey, but these are still gonna emerge later. And that's because the queen likes to start in the middle when she's laying and then go out in a circular pattern. So you'll kind of see that pattern um, in your colonies. The outside will emerge first and then she'll sometimes go back in and lay again. And it's really neat. Hey, Amy, why to watch? Why are those different than how are those different than regular uh, female girl girl bees? Girl bees. <laughs> so the drones We'll show you. Yeah, those big guys. These big guys. <laughs> and the reason I can do that so easily is they don't have a stinger. <laughs> See this little guy? They make great pets. Yes. Yeah. You can put cute. a little... A little, a little thread on them and fly them around. Yeah, no, I just give kidding. them to my kids, though, <laughs> if one's been kicked out. But they're different than the worker bees. Um, the, they stink. This one's emerging right here, but they're different in that they don't go out and collect pollen and nectar. Their sole job, like Anita was saying earlier, is to find a queen and mate with her. Um, and there is some research that they're finding perhaps um, they um, do have other tasks, but as we know it, um, their sole task is to mate with a queen. So, And they have like these kind of popped up uh, peanut looking um, brood cells, whereas you'll see the females have really beautiful flat patterns. Um, that So you know the difference between males and female brood, which is what we call the babies, between uh, based on how the brood pattern looks. So we'll see. This is all nectar. Well, no. The queen bit went back and laid in this smaller comb down here. See how these cells, the cells on the other comb were bigger? These smaller cells are worker brood cells. So that's where the female workers are laid by the queen. And she's gone back and you can see larva in these cells. And I don't know if you can hopefully, hopefully zoom we in can. that far. But there's little white um, plump larva growing ah. inside of those cells. So. Kids, how many sides of a hexagon are there? I mean, that's what the the cells are made of, right? Hexagons. Right, hexagon. Guess yeah. how many sided uh, cells are a honeybee comb? Hexagon is <laughs> six sides. Six sides. I'm like, I'm gonna say it wrong. <laughs> okay, I'm nervous. All right, so here, okay, this is like an educational bar. Yes. Um, and I oh, say that goodness. because you have your resources or honey at the top. Here comes the tractor. Um, and then you have worker brood right here that's capped and it's smaller. And then you have the male drone brood that's bigger and sticks out like popcorn, like Anita said. Um, peanuts. Peanuts. And popcorn. And popcorn. Think of All food. the snacks. <laughs> All the snacks. <laughs> that her bees help us eat. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, that's a great bar to show you just the difference in um, brood comb and worker comb. If we see the queen, we will we'll try to point her yeah, out. Yeah, I you haven't know. been looking too closely like I that's should. Always very exciting to see the queen. You know, it knows she's alive and well. Long live the queen. Yes, and you're always wanting to look for her in the hive to make sure your hive's queen right. You want to make sure you either see eggs or the queen. And this is queen right. This yes. is a good hive. There's brood. Yeah, I love this hive. So you don't see, so tell us a little bit about the specialization of tasks, Amy, as they come out of their, the brood, the yeah. babies. Yeah, so this is an excellent bar of brood. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm almost distracted by it, but <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> like Beautiful. Anita said, we get a little uh, mesmerized. mesmerized by the bees always, um, but 
So the different tasks the worker bees have that we keep talking about, they do all this work, right? Well, what work do they do? Well, their first job after they've emerged from this comb is they go back into the cell they emerged from and they clean it out because that's where they've pupated, kind of like a caterpillar pupates um, and turns into a butterfly. That white larva, which is down here, um, pupates after it's capped and turns into a bee. So she'll go back, clean out her cell, and um, then I think the next task she'll have is a nurse bee. So she's gonna go stay in the hive and take care of the larvae, which are fed, I think, thousands of times a day um, by all the little worker bees around it. So her next task is to be that nurse bee and take care of the colony inside the hive. Um, another task they have is wax making. So when they're in that phase, which is usually spring, early summer, they're building up a little bit, um, secreting more wax, and they'll create comb, um, they'll cap honey, they'll cap brood. Um, and then, can you hear me okay? And then their last <laughs> job, um, after they've you know been a nurse bee, cleaned out their cell, um, created wax, you know what, guard bees. I was gonna say foragers are the last, but we also have guard bees. There's bees that have to protect the hive um, from intruders like ourselves. Um, these bees are so nice. <laughs> but um, you know, if there's a skunk, raccoons, bears, things like that, the guard bees are there to um, protect the colony. And they kind of hang out near the entrance and stand guard. Um, so that's another task they have. And then their last and final job is to forage. So the oldest bees in the hives are in the hive are the bees that you see out foraging on your flowers. And their job is to collect pollen and nectar for the hive. Um, so they'll bring that back to the hive and they'll place it in the appropriate cells. Um, but yeah, worker bees live only five to six weeks. And so any bees you see out on flowers and whatnot, they're probably, you know, around that five to six week mark. And um, what's really interesting, I wanted to say real quick, is when, I'll go to the next bar or two, is when a worker bee comes back with honey, she doesn't go in and put it in a cell. And this is kind of another job the bees have. She comes back to the hive with her honey, um, in her honey stomach, they have two stomachs, and she gives it to another worker bee. And then that second worker bee then places it into honeycomb. And that process <laughs> when they're transferring honey from one bee to another is called trophallaxis. So honey is really like bee digestibles. Yeah. Full of bee, and they inject it. They inject honey with uh, enzymes and amino acids, and that's why honey is so healthy and good for you because it has the local um, nutrition from flowers in your area that can kind of inoculate you if you're uh, allergic to certain kinds of, you know, plants or we what we call weeds, but bees don't acknowledge weeds. Everything is it's a plant. Good food. Um, yeah, so, so they inoculate their honey with healthy um, bacteria, right? Well, it's funny, I, don't, I know they have enzymes, and I was doing another video and I said bacteria, and I want to do more research because I'm not sure if the honey mixes with bacteria in their gut, but I do know it mixes with enzymes and amino acids. Yeah. Um, and Her that's the reason the queen can't feed herself is because she doesn't have those digestive oh, enzymes okay. that the worker bees have. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Well, and today? you know, pollen, which is also good for us, has protein in it. You mix the pollen that they, can, they get from the flowers. Yes, so pollen is also has protein in it that's really good for babies. Yes, Baby pollen bees. is their protein source and honey is their carbohydrate. Yes. Um and so whenever the remember when I said there's nurse bees feeding the baby bees, they give them what's called bee bread and that's a mixture of pollen and nectar. So they mix it up, put it through yes. their gut, and then they kind of spit it out to their babies. And so basically, yeah, when we eat honey and anything from the hive, it's like a, a spit, a, has bee spit in it. Yep. Hey, um, Amy, do you want to talk about the cycle 
of the bees, like how, you know, from queen and what, how the queen is different? Yeah, it's funny. I was thinking about that too, as we were talking. Um, so as we're looking for the queen, wow, look at this red propolis. Whoa. Oh, Do you see that? I don't think that's Red falling. orange, that is beautiful, yeah. Uh, propolis, and that's the yeah. resin from trees and plants they get. Propolis, I that's know, that's how shiny it is. And look at this butterfly. This. I could be wrong, it could be pollen, but I think it's red propolis. Really? And that's what they use to seal up the hive. See all this sticky stuff? I get yeah. a, see, here's some of that red propolis. Oh my gosh, um, well, that's propolis. I, know, I wish I knew what plant that was from. You know, I just want to say quickly that everything from the hive, I mean, we think of what bees give us as a gift, and that's why I think as honey beekeepers, we honor them because we want to be very, we want to reverence them because everything from the hive is a gift. From honey, pollen, it's for medicinal purposes, even the propolis, right? Yes. Propolis is medicinal because it has, I, I mean, I make it in um, with like, um, you put it, mix it with alcohol and create an, uh, it's kind of like an essence of propolis that is antibacterial, maybe even antiviral, viral, I don't know, but antibacterial for sure. And people use it for mouthwashes. I use it to um, paint the inside of the hive because I like to... Keeps the bees healthy. Yeah, it keeps, it's very, it, it keep, it's medicinal for the bees and it can be medicinal for us too. But anyway, there's lots of like... So we got to, yeah, see, we're always distracted. Lots of boys in there. Yeah. That's what mine's doing too at home. I just don't know what, what to do with them. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit about the cycle of like an entire colony. Um, and we can, so we were mentioning like a queen and worker bees, um, and I wanted to say that any egg in the hive that the queen lays, the queen is the only one that lays eggs. Actually, she lays, if it's fertilized, she can lay a a fertilized or unfertilized egg. Um, There's a waggle dance right here. For the first three days, we're looking oh, for a waggle dance. There was a waggle dance. We can talk about that afterwards, but yeah. you can catch it on camera where they're... I'll be looking while I talk. Vibrating their butts. Um, okay. So see all this honey oh coming in? Make the wax all felt like that when they have, when they're on a nectar flow. Um, but anyway, so that egg that the queen lays, the first three days before it becomes larva, um, it has the potential of becoming a queen if it's fed only royal jelly. But after that third day, um, bees begin to feed
they survive winter. And so if you don't keep Varroa under control and you go into winter um, with a colony that has had a high mite load, it's highly unlikely that they're gonna survive mm. um, the winter. So my, so that's the biggest thing beekeepers are learning to test and treat and a lot of treatments are no longer working like chemicals because the, the mites become immune but um, we're learning how to work with the bees Oops. to Don't tape this um, keep part. them healthy. I also want to say that it's really important to note that bees are very sensitive to chemicals. So when you use chemicals or the, the city uses chemicals on public spaces, um, they, they can cause They've been known to cause infertility for the queen. They can cause, um, especially insecticides, you know, pest, there's pesticides um, that are really dangerous. Bees are like the canary in the mine. You know, we're not, they don't help us any either. So how do we uh, use alternatives to pesticides and insecticides that cause um, reduce the immune system of the whole hive you know bees are mm -hmm. it's not just one bee it's the, the immune system of the whole hive so reducing pesticides and insecticides especially in your backyards friends is really important we work with the city trying to do that and also habitat loss is so huge for for bees native bees and honeybees you know cutting down uh, their natural habitat or reducing that. Um, so that's why you guys get to plant flowers and bushes and flowering trees that are native plants here because that can um, boost their food, their food source. And then they can, right. and then they can do their business of pollinating our food source. So we really ask you to go to your local nursery and ask them what are best pollinator plants. And that would be fabulous for all of our bees you yeah. know we have how many bees i mean we probably have like how many bees of native bees in the whole country we have like is it 2000 total or is that 2, 000, like 2000 I, some here I 2000 in the country and then yeah. in this state alone we have like i don't know five to seven hundred of them yeah we're one of the more variable places for native bees because a lot of native bees live in the ground they're ground nesters and so because it's dry and we don't get flooding and things like that you see um, more diversity in bee species in like yeah. new mexico arizona california has the most i think species but california is also bigger um but yeah we get a lot of native bees here and in the dry desert because they can nest in the ground bumblebees are one native bee bumblebees yeah. and there's so many different tiny bees you can't even see all the time They're but beautiful. these are honeybees these were imported from europe originally um, honeybees we use we like them because they give us honey but native bees are also incredible pollinators almost more efficient than uh, honeybees mm -hmm. so um well we're going to do a yeah. question and answer after uh we thank you amy yeah. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Anita. Um, but quick, tell us about um, this hive. It's you know versus uh, some of the other hives you know about, like the mm -hmm. Langstroth and what 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 not. What are these differences? Okay, so well, I think before we talk about that, I'll mention like if the bees were in a tree, like the one behind us, and there was like an empty cavity, and they decided to build a hive there, they would kind of start at the bottom and build their way up. <laughs> and then maybe go back down to the bottom later after it had been cleaned out by wax moss or whatever. So they kind of have a tendency to build up. And these top bar hives were kind of taking that concept, and I guess I should say, say the tree falls, right? They're building sideways. And that's what this top bar hive is. It is kind of like a colony um, in a tree trunk or in a log, you can imagine it. And what we're doing as beekeepers is we're getting them to build comb in a way that we can manipulate the hive. So we can pull out comb without destroying um, their hive. And so a top bar hive, like you saw, it's like that round log of a tree. And then we have all those bars set on top. And the reason we do that is so that they'll hang the wax and comb and um, 
put honey in there and their baby bees, and then we can look at it and inspect it without um, causing a lot of destruction to the colony and making the bees angry. You saw how gentle they were. They, they just, I mean, these bees, I can probably safely say they almost don't mind it because um, we're gentle and careful. And before people started keeping bees in hives and whatnot, I'm sure you've seen the cute little skeps, the, um, it's like the rope that goes around and it's really decorative like bee stuff. Baskets. Um, well those, I think they could get some comb out without destroying the whole hive, but for the most part, you did do a lot of destruction to the beehive with those and other ways of beekeeping. And now modern beekeeping, I think, when did Langstroth? It was in the eight, late 1800s. Late 1800s. And he called it, talked about the bee space. Uh, yes. So we have top our hives and then, but more um, common and popular is the Langstroth hive. And I wish we had some down here to show you, but it's like those Winnie the Pooh hives. You see those square white boxes all piled on top of each other. Those are Langstroth hives. And so in a top bar hive, they start in the front and they grow towards the back. Well, a Langstroth hive would be like this, but upside down. So they would start at the bottom where you have your brood and they have a tendency to build up. So they put their brood at the bottom and they store their honey at the top. Top bar hive, they have their brood towards the front and then they store their honey towards the back. So it's kind of like a difference in orientation. And then on the Langstroth hive, you have a box with eight or 10 frames in it, kind of like the top bars, but they're spaced with bee space. So we kind of researched, you know, how much space do bees have in their wild feral colonies between comb? And then we mimic that in our hives so that we can manipulate the comb and pull it out and they don't have a tendency to um, build them. it together mm -hmm. and squish together. So, and a bee can fit in between their bee space. So anyways, the Langstroth box will have eight to 10 frames in line, kind of like the top bar, but you'll see that space and then um, you put other boxes on top as the colony grows. And so you have like, almost like bars on top of bars in a Langstroth hive. So yeah, and I think what's neat about beekeeping in different hives is if you learn what bees do in nature and you kind of get some experience with what we're, they're doing at different times of the year, it becomes a lot easier to um, move from one type of hive box to another, so. So we want to thank you guys for tuning in today and we're going to have a question and answer period. You might want to know more about different kinds of um, breeds of bees. They come from all over the world and they're adapted to different regions. Uh, there's lots of other different kinds of hive boxes, um, beehive boxes that we can talk about. But um, anyway, we're so cool. glad. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, uh, Henry. You get to be uh, inducted into the Bee Hall of Fame for being so being so close to the bees and just hanging in there like a statue for the last hour. <laughs> I know, I'm all walking and I hate towards with, with the bees. bees flying out. So thank you so much, and thank, thank you all you. for joining us. So, hi everybody. Are we on live? I think we are. <laughs> I don't know, I'll be honest. I think everyone the can sound. hear me, but I can't see um, the questions, Anita. I was trying to pull up the questions people may have on the YouTube. So I don't know if you can look at them and like tell me. I know that was my job, but I cannot find them. But I think this should be streaming to the live stream now, the Zoom.
Hey guys. Hey. Everybody's here. We're we're waiting on questions. I don't see any questions coming in on YouTube except for one that um our account has posted. Okay. But everything seems to still be live. Um, yeah, just kind of hanging in here. I see you, Amy. I do hear Anita. Okay. Just kind of been hanging here tight since the uh, the video ended. So will this video be available now that it's gone live to share? Or is yeah, it this this Q and A is available. And the one that we just we just broadcast as well. But right now we're in the Q and A period and we're just kind of hanging tight waiting for any. Um I did see you had some viewers on YouTube, but there was one question that our account had posted. I don't know if anybody else had been logged in, but they asked if you can get a tax credit for having bees on your land. Um, I know you can. Um, it's an agricultural like tax exempt thing for your property tax, but I don't really know the um, details, unfortunately, um, regarding that tax exemption. So um, I don't want to speak too much on that. But it's out there. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I can facilitate these YouTube questions coming in, but as the moment, as we were just kind of watching, and if you guys are on your own Facebook too, if you guys have gotten any feedback or any Facebook questions, feel free to bring those in and answer those as well. Okay. I'm looking. So I can ask a question here too as well. Um, I did see you guys talking a lot about the medical purposes of many parts of the bee hive and what they produce for us. Um, <clears throat> would you recommend like any specific places you would want to get that from, or is there a benefit from like getting those local pollen? You know, the pollen and the honey is that better for you as far as like maybe the allergies or other medical stuff? It's kind of a loaded question, but lots of stuff. I can ask a question here too as well. Um, I did see you guys talking a lot about the medical purposes of many parts of the bee uh -oh. hive and what they produce for us. Um, <clears throat> would you recommend like any? I'm sorry. I think I may have played that back to you when I opened that window. But um, you were asking about um, like the medicinal benefits of honey and pollen. So um, I kind of have mixed ideas about that because people do claim that they benefit from having honey from a local hive because it does contain some of the pollen um, in the area which um, they say makes you less susceptible to the allergies of that pollen. But um, when you think about it, a lot of plants that are wind pollinated are the ones that release pollen with the wind and that we have a lot of um, allergic reactions to because it's floating around in the air. Um, and so they aren't necessarily um, pollinated by the bees as much, um, but they can be. So um, I think it really just depends on like what um, flowers are in bloom and like if the bees don't have enough of the more I guess, healthy pollen for them, then they will go to things that are wind pollinated like corn that might, I mean, not saying people are allergic to corn pollen, but things that are pollinated by the wind, they'll kind of go to those secondary pollen sources that might not be so great and pollinate those. And then you'll get that pollen, you know, some of that in the honey and the pollen that we consume that could then help with allergies. So yeah, I think there's definitely some benefit to having um, local honey and pollen um, to alleviate allergies because you get that um, exposure. Nice, thanks. Um, don't see any more YouTube questions coming in, but I mean, if there anything else you guys would like to talk about or add? I think I would just 
like to say thank you for watching and um you can always reach out to us later with questions um by going to deserthives.com or um trying to think of other ways we'll be available but um yeah would love to answer more questions i'm trying to think of questions that would have come up while you're watching the video um what do you think anita I don't think she can hear me. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that would be on her speaker end. It's um, I did want to look at we we posted because the video was choppy. Um, I had Diego working in the background, but he was able to get a link up, and so for that full video of the day in the beehive, um, you should be able to go there um on our page pretty okay, quickly great. and uh view the whole thing um should be nice and, and clear and easy um so to correct that but other than that yeah i don't i don't know if anita can hear us your mic's muted yeah she said she has no sound and yeah i don't know if you're getting the text coming in <laughs> she's just not hearing us so yeah cool thanks yeah some technical difficulties on that zoom in so yeah i appreciate you guys and um, i'm gonna go ahead and we're all done today okay thank you so much and thanks for the link bye everyone